In the intricate tapestry of narratives that form the world of Red Dead Redemption 2, few characters have stirred as much controversy and debate as Micah Bell. The game, a masterpiece of interactive storytelling by Rockstar Games, presents a Wild West epic where loyalty and betrayal are central themes. Among the community of gamers and critics alike, the assertion that Micah Bell is the treacherous rat who betrays the Vanderland gang has become a popular conviction. However, upon a closer and more critical examination of the narrative, as well as the nuanced portrayal of characters and their relationships, a compelling argument can be made that Micah Bell, despite his many flaws, may not be the informant that many assume him to be. This investigation aims to unravel the layers of misdirection and challenge the prevailing narrative by presenting a case for Micah Bell's innocence in the context of betrayal, thereby inviting a revaluation of the evidence that has perhaps too hastily led to his widespread condemnation. Upon examining the game more closely, it becomes subtly apparent that Micah Bell operates under a loosely defined code of honor, as suggested by the benefits players receive during missions involving him. Take, for instance, the mission where Arthur Morgan orchestrates Micah's escape from Strawberry's lockup, where he was detained, allegedly during a reconnaissance task. This escape, which results in the decimation of the town, is one of the first high-octane missions featuring intense gunfights. During this mission, Micah rewards the player with a second gun holster, enhancing the gameplay significantly by enabling dual wielding and the capacity to carry an additional gun. Subsequently, in a heist with only Micah and Arthur, prior to any betrayal within the game, the operation is executed with relative ease, barring an unexpected clash with the O'Driscolls. Once more, the payoff is substantial, akin to the earlier rescue mission. This heist marks the gang's, as well as Micah's and Arthur's, first substantial financial gain. At the game's onset, Micah clumsily tries to bond with Arthur, frequently referring to him as family or likening their bond to that of brothers. The authenticity of his sentiments remains questionable. However, the narrative takes an unexpected turn in the epilogue. It's revealed that Micah, not Javier or Bill, had been Dutch's constant companion during their six years as fugitives, even after Dutch became cognizant of Micah's alleged treachery. Given that law enforcement was relentlessly pursuing Dutch and the Blackwater loot, it stands to reason that Micah, the purported snitch, had ample chances to betray Dutch throughout those years. If Micah's ultimate goal was to hand Dutch over to the authorities, why then did no such betrayal occur during those six years on the run? This presents a puzzling inconsistency. Transitioning from a defensive stance to an offensive one, it's crucial to recall a key element in our makeshift sleuthing. Uncle introduced a woman of the night, Abigail Roberts, into the fold, who subsequently became a member of the Vanderland gang. Her involvement with the gang led to a romantic entanglement with John Marston, and she bore his child, Jack Marston. Despite this, John denied any paternal ties, rejecting the notion of being a father. For those curious about the paternity drama, I've delved into it in a video exploring the possibility of Abigail's infidelity and questioning Jack's parentage. Raised collectively by the gang, Jack was a toddler when John abruptly severed ties and vanished from the gang's life, leaving Arthur feeling a sense of betrayal. Although John eventually made his way back to the gang after about a year, Arthur's sense of betrayal wasn't easily dismissed, even as Dutch and the rest welcomed John back without hesitation. Uh, he disappeared on us for a while, when Jack was real young, a long while, a year ago. He did? And we was family, you know? Guess I still ain't fully forgiven him for that. Oddly enough, John doesn't have any personal missions. He never seeks Arthur's help, nor does he accompany him on leisurely activities like fishing or hunting. Even when his living conditions are improved, he doesn't express gratitude. John's detachment suggests an indifference to the gang's dynamics and happenings. John Marston emerges as a prime suspect in our investigation, and despite how surprising this hypothesis may seem, there are two compelling reasons to explore it further. The first is John's mysterious absence. For an entire year, his whereabouts remained unknown, with no one in the gang privy to his activities during that time. 
His sudden departure and equally abrupt return raised suspicions, leading to speculation that he might have struck a deal with the Pinkertons, either by choice or under duress after being captured. The second aspect to consider is John's possible motive. The guilt and internal conflict suggested by his flight from the camp could be tied to his refusal to acknowledge Jack as his son, stemming from suspicions of Abigail's fidelity. If John believed that Abigail was unfaithful, possibly with multiple gang members, it's conceivable that he could not come to terms with this. The thought that Abigail should be exclusively his could have been a driving force behind his actions. Upon John Marston's return to the camp, he was warmly received by Dutch and the others, yet Arthur viewed him with suspicion, openly branding him a traitor for the first time. Shortly after, Micah introduced a ferry heist plan, which coincided with Arthur and Hosea's separate scheme. This situation presented John with an opportunity to betray the gang to the Pinkertons without remorse. Despite the gang's successful escape with a substantial sum, the plot thickens when Agent Milton approaches Arthur with a proposition, revealing intimate knowledge of Arthur's past and Dutch's influence on him. Details that could only have been disclosed by someone close to Arthur, such as Dutch, Hosea, or John. Arthur Morgan. Vanderlyn's most trusted associate. You've read the files. Typical case. Orphan street kid seduced by that maniac silver tongue and matures into a degenerate murderer. Agent Milton. Agent Ross. Pinkerton Detective Agency. Seconded to the United States government. Nice to finally meet. We know a lot about you. Do you? You're a wanted man, Mr. Morgan. $5,000 for your head alone. $5,000? For me? Can I turn myself in? The narrative progresses to a train heist where Arthur, who had previously mocked John for his simplicity, suddenly commends his cleverness. Put it on the tracks. They see it. They know they either have to stop or die. Ain't no train driver wants to be cooked alive. That is... Kind of brilliant. Uh, for you. <laughs> and that is a real idea. I think that's the first time you ever had one of them. <laughs> Shut up. You might be the first bastard to ever have half his brains eaten by a wolf and end up more intelligent. So we doing it? Yeah, we're gonna need ammunition, guns, look real frightening, and some dynamite to open up the train. I'll get the supplies. Gotta head into town for Abigail anyway. Don't even ask. You go find us an oil wagon. John's apparent insight into matters unknown to the rest of the gang raises questions. In the sheep and goats mission, John's shrewdness is on display again as he skillfully negotiates with a sheep buyer and involves Arthur in a meeting with Dutch and Strauss, who, while not a fighter, serves as a key witness. During this mission, John is captured alongside Strauss, leading to a hasty retreat for medical attention after Strauss is injured. Curiously, John later undertakes a risky venture back to Saint Denis to collect debts from the sheep sale, despite the town being heavily surveilled by law enforcement, making a safe and solo departure seem impossible. John said he was going back to the auction yard to collect the money for those sheep. He'd be a damn idiot going anywhere near that town right now. Uh, he reckoned he'd be able to slip in and out. Oh, well, if it's John's idea, it must be a good one. The most intriguing part is a cutscene where Milton confronts John with the question, Who are you? And addresses him as Rip Van Winkle. Hey Dutch, we got a problem. Not a problem. Visitors. A solution. Good day, fine people. Mr. Vanderland. Mr. Matthews, I presume. And who are you? Rip Van Winkle. Huh. Good day, sir. This peculiar interaction suggests that Milton deliberately feigns ignorance of John's identity to divert any suspicion from him, despite having previously encountered him in Valentine. It's worth noting that this obfuscation comes from Andrew Milton, a man doggedly tracking the gang and well-versed in Arthur's history. This raises the question, why would Milton, of all people, pretend not to recognize one of the gang's key figures? The implication is that there may be more to John's story and his relationship with the Pinkertons than meets the eye, inviting us to draw our own conclusions. 
In the aftermath of the tense negotiations, it became evident that neither the Pinkertons nor the Van der Lind gang would budge. The Pinkertons refused to relent in their pursuit of Dutch, and the gang's hope for the freedom they'd been promised remained elusive. Milton's stance was uncompromising, signaling a shift to more drastic measures, a point driven home by the tragic death of Hosa in a failed bank heist which escalated the situation dramatically. Yet, amidst the heightened stakes, John's predicament seemed oddly mild. He was merely arrested during the same heist, and Abigail vanished as though planned ahead of time. Micah showed no concern for Abigail, unlike John, suggesting either a stroke of luck on her part or a role in a larger scheme. The gang managed a narrow escape, while John was conveniently spared the noose, aligning with the theory that his capture was part of a larger plan. If the accusations against John seemed excessive, the next conjecture might be even more startling. Consider the possibility that Dutch's apparent madness isn't as straightforward as it seems. Rockstar Games, known for their scrupulous attention to detail and dialogue, could be intentionally planting seeds of doubt regarding Dutch, whose reliability both Arthur and the player increasingly question. Revisiting Chapter 5, Dutch's paranoia appears to escalate, especially evident in Guama, where his erratic behavior peaks. Just a second. Pay more. For pain now. What? What are you doing? Oh, Jesus. Easy, Dutch. What was that? Horrible old crone. But you killed her. She was gonna betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. You sure you're all right, Dutch? I am just trying to make sure that some of us survive, Arthur. Now, shall we proceed? His inexplicable knowledge of Spanish and his heightened instincts suggest an unraveling mind. Yet, despite his seemingly irrational state, Dutch insists that John is a traitor, echoing earlier suspicions about the bank heist where John was the only one captured alive, while Jose and Lenny met their end. U.S. So what happened with John in that bank? He survived. Unlike dear Jose and Lenny, the only one they took alive. Why is that, you think? I don't know. I was already on the roof. I didn't see it. And Abigail, I presume she was able to slip away in time. What are you talking about? You know, when I look back at all the chaos of the past few weeks, the apparent superficial chaos, I begin to wonder, maybe, for somebody, this is all going exactly to plan. I still ain't sure what you're saying, Dutch. Nor am I quite, but... That many Pinkertons arriving like clockwork once again? By this point in the narrative, Arthur and the player are inclined to dismiss Dutch as deranged and Micah as the true betrayer. However, the lingering questions about John's survival and Abigail's timely disappearance hint at a complex web of deceit and manipulation that challenges the player to reconsider who the real traitors might be within the game's ranks. In the murky depths of Beaver Hollow, Molly's startling confession throws the gang into disarray, ratcheting up the tension. Defying Dutch's orders, we orchestrate John's escape from incarceration, a move that, had it not been made, might have allowed for a smoother outcome. With John's return to the gang, he wastes no time in participating in a train heist, which inexplicably bypasses its scheduled stop and heads straight into a trap. John is shot and presumed dead after tumbling from the train, while Dutch and the others narrowly escape a law enforcement patrol. The plot thickens as the Pinkertons strike, abducting Abigail from the camp. Curiously, they choose Abigail, not any other female member, which seems to confirm the existence of a deal. The gang's hit out is compromised, John is believed dead, and the Pinkertons are closing in on the gang and the key to their riches. But plans go awry when Arthur and Sadie intervene, rescuing Abigail. During the confrontation, Milton reveals Micah's betrayal to a gravely ill Arthur, yet Abigail ends up killing Milton, and they all flee back to camp with the crucial key to the money. John miraculously survives again, evading capture despite his injuries. Now he must locate Abigail and fulfill his end of the bargain, recover the money and deliver Dutch to the Pinkertons. Dutch, taken aback by John's survival against the odds, confronts the issue of betrayal head-on. 
At this critical juncture, as John's situation seems most dire, the Pinkertons he supposedly led to the camp arrive, sparking the final pursuit. Notably, the Pinkertons' focus shifts away from Arthur, allowing him and Micah to engage in their last stand and Arthur's poignant final. Years later, Micah still hasn't betrayed Dutch and John roams the game world, proclaiming Arthur's heroism. This narrative by Rockstar cleverly manipulates the player's emotions, casting Arthur as a savior. John's repeated affirmations of Arthur's heroism seem to serve as self-assurance, a way to absolve himself from any lingering Pinkerton ties and claim the money with a clear conscience. However, the Pinkertons' demands remain, return the money and capture Dutch. This backdrop sets the stage for the events of RDR1, where John's eventual demise seems less a result of Agent Ross's cruelty and more a poignant act of redemption.